Hi guys, uh, Dr. Ken Zornberger here again. <laughs> Gee, I think this is the twelfth in a series that I started after I had my surgery. And uh, these are, if you, these are the most important YouTube presentations I've ever made. Uh, I haven't made many, but this, these are really important ones. And uh, it's kind of exciting. I, I'm enjoying myself teaching you the, the most important and basic things you need to know to become regularly successful at taking whitetails, especially mature bucks. And uh, this is fun for me. You know, back in the 1960s, when I first discovered you could actually identify whitetails by tr their track lengths, I started to look around wondering if, gee, I wonder if this can be done with other whitetail signs like their beds, which you can, and their droppings also, and antler rubs and ground scrapes and other signs made by deer. Uh, it got to be kind of interesting. Uh, one of the things I learned is that you could actually uh, accurately identify whitetails by their droppings as well. Uh, in case you've never hunted whitetail, whitetails before, their droppings are different than what uh, are made by most animals that live in the woods. Their droppings are little egg-shaped or little oblong-shaped droppings, individual droppings, puddles of them or clumps of them, rather than droppings made by, say, uh, wolves or, or bears. Uh, or other creatures in the woods. They're, they're little, little pellets kind of things. The lengths of those pellets, like lengths of their deer tracks, can, are, can accurately determine uh, what kind of deer made the droppings. Like, for example, uh, when those, when they defecate or they create feces, or whatever you want to call them, or scats, you get a puddle of droppings. Uh, usually maybe that big around and there's a whole bunch of individual droppings in that puddle and uh, this is typical of, of dull droppings. Buck droppings on the other hand in the fall especially tend to be clumped, a whole bunch of droppings stuck together in a long clump of droppings. Usually when those clumps hit the ground they bust up into two, three, four or more pieces, but the droppings are stuck together like they're sticky and they get a little bit flattened in places. But like dough droppings, you can measure the lengths of the individual droppings in the clump and they will tell you what kind of a deer made the dropping. Clump droppings right away, you should be thinking, that's buck droppings. Even little buck fawns. Uh, a lot of them will have clump droppings too, be little, little clumps, but a quarter inch long droppings in their tight. That's a font, and the clump means buck deer. So anyway, uh, so early, when I was in the 19, well, early 1980s, I started creating these cards. Uh, the cards were made to answer the 12 most common questions that I was given. Uh, after presenting a seminar on whitetails and whitetail hunting. And, and of course, when I started talking about lengths of droppings, people wanted some kind of a permanent record they could use that would help them uh, to remember these lengths when they're out there in the woods scouting or hunting. So the first cards I made were like this. Okay, so back in the early 1980s, we decided we needed to provide a card for droppings. And on this card you can see there's a whole list of droppings for various deer, from fawn to two and a half year old doe, mature doe and or yearling buck. And the reason for that is those deer are about the same size. A yearling buck and a mature doe here in Minnesota, one of the most northern states across the United States, will have droppings that are about one half inch in length, not counting the little nubbins at the end. I used to tell people to properly measure 
droppings, you should bite off those little nubbins before you put a ruler on them. That was kind of a joke. But anyway, so we had a two and a half year old buck and that same group like in tracks of bucks three and a half to six and a half years of age, which produced the largest droppings. So, well, this card was popular. Uh, people even stole it <laughs> at, at sports shows and grabbed that card. They want that card. They want to be able to remember all those numbers. And uh, but and then on the back side, had tips about droppings as well. But this was not a easy card for people to be carrying around the woods. And so later on, I came up with smaller cards, pocket size, uh, 12 cards in a non-glare plastic pocket. And uh, this has been popular ever since. We just sell these things year round, year after year after year. And for good reason, because they provide really good information about things like tracks and droppings and beds and uh, antlerods and ground scrapes and how to identify home ranges of deer, things like that, how to properly field dress a deer, uh, how to uh, recover a wounded deer, uh, lots of good tips in these cards. But anyway, this is the newest one. And, uh, and as you can see, droppings are, are progressively larger when you go from fawn to the big dominant bucks, dominant breeding bucks, with commonly weigh twice as much as a mature adult, and consequently their droppings are much bigger. The thing about bucks too, buck droppings, is uh, they range in, in uh, size and uh, shape from buck to buck. You can have bucks out there that will have a dropping that isn't egg shaped like this one, but long. And it seems that those droppings tend to be drier than, than the egg shaped one. They tend to be more moist and uh, darker in color. But, but if you have a long dropping that's an inch long, or uh, that you find an area that clumped, or even not clumped, that's a big buck. That's, that's a trophy class buck for sure. But if you find one with an egg shaped dropping and they're an inch long, uh, that's the same thing. It's a really big buck, and it's probably one you'd put on the wall. Uh, if you have one buck, doesn't usually create long, narrow-shaped drop, uh, droppings and egg-shaped droppings. Usually, uh, one buck will always produce the egg shape and other long, narrow ones, and which means that wherever you find them, you're looking at uh, droppings made by a trophy by a two trophy class buck, so that's one way to individuate to uh, determine uh, how many really big bucks you have in any one area. But those, that would be two different big bucks. Okay, now, like with tracks, there's a cutoff on sizes of droppings. Uh, when you get to past the mature adult or yearling buck size droppings, which are half inch long in northern states, Anything bigger than that is a mature buck. Uh, up where my boys and I hunt whitetails, anything bigger than that is a buck we'll spend time hunting. Now, two and a half year old buck droppings where we hunt are five eighths inch in length. And, but the bucks we really want are the ones that have droppings that are three quarters of an inch to an inch in length. That's the ones we really want. Uh, later in the season, for example, if we, uh, we've taken three bucks that have a big dropping and it's getting toward the end of the season, we'll start looking more seriously at two and a half year old bucks. Uh, earlier in the season, we kind of sit back and just watch that side of a buck go by. You typically, it's, they're six pointers, uh, sometimes seven, uh, and their antlers are relatively small. They only have a spread of 12 to 14 inches in the the tines are rather thin on those bucks. But if we need an extra buck, we'll take a two and a half year old to fill out our self-imposed number that we take each year, like four, 
200 bucks a season. So, but most of the bucks we're looking for have three quarter to one inch long droppings. Now and then we'll find one that has droppings that are an inch and an eighth, even up to an inch and a quarter in line. Now one thing about droppings, especially where there's individual puddles of droppings made by a deer, you'll see in that puddle, if you get down there on your knees and study them, you'll see that almost all of them are one size. But there will be some big ones, bigger ones, like in a puddle of doe droppings, you might find some 5 8 inch long droppings and some 3 8 smaller, some bigger. And uh, But most of them, 90% of them or more, will be one half inch in, in uh, size. Then always choose the most common dropping to accurately identify the deer that made the droppings. So don't think, oh, here's a 5 8 inch here. This, this must be a two and a half year old buck. That just won't be true. You know, it's kind of amazing though about droppings. You know, you can walk through the woods and you see some one inch droppings and you think, oh my gosh, here's a big buck living in this area here, spending time on this trail or in this feeding area. And uh, there's, there's lots of fresh ones in that feeding area or on that trail. Uh, and lots of older ones, which tell you, this buck, big buck, is using this area a lot. This is a favorite area. It's the kind of things we're looking for when we scout before the season begins. But it's kind of amazing, you know, you see those big droppings, you've never seen that buck before, but now you know he's there. And you probably won't see the buck there until you've done things right and you're sitting at your stand site and uh, the sun is getting close to coming up, it's getting bright out in the woods and oh, something moved over there and you look and for the first time from the whole, all of the time you've put into hunting that particular buck, this, the first time you see it will be the time when you actually take it. Here he is, finally, pow, pow. Everything worked out just well. You put the buck down on his tracks. Wow. It's kind of amazing. You can start out with nothing more than, that, than a droppings like that and take a big buck because you know he's there now and you know which trails he's using a lot or which uh, feeding area he's favoring at the, this particular time. And so I'm, I've taken quite a few bucks and so have my sons in years when there was no snow on the ground during hunting season. Lots of leaves. When there are lots of leaves on the ground, trails are covered with leaves. Uh, it can be hard to find tracks. They're far and few in between, and even if you do find one, unless it's in an area that's really important to a buck when he's up and moving around, like a feeding area, it might not mean anything. But it seems like, no matter in situations like that, you always can find droppings. Uh, Whitetails stop to empty their balls a lot. It's kind of amazing. Uh, during the time they're out in the feeding area, they're every now and then they're stopping uh, to empty balls. They're, there's two places where they do this a lot. One is in a bedding area, and one is in a feeding area. One of the one of the signs that tells you this is a feeding area is lots of droppings here and there, puddles and plump droppings. You walk through an area that looks like it could be a feeding area, the kind of foods that whitetails eat are there. Uh, we'll have a presentation on all of that one of these days. But lots of droppings tell you this is a favorite area of a specific deer of the, that uh, are of the size of the droppings that you find there. Uh, but there have been times when we put uh, signs of individual deer have been hard to find because of all the and no snow. And sometimes droppings have been the only signs we have and they have enabled us to take big bucks, mature bucks during the hunting season with no other signs available. So don't poo-poo 
<laughs> Deer droppings. They're as important as tracks when hunting older bucks. And uh, it's, uh, like I say, that sometimes that's the only thing you're going to find out there. But don't don't say that. Don't believe that because of that, your odds of taking a big buck are far less than they would be. Okay, now. It's important. There's a lot of things that dropping can tell you about whitetails that made them, besides telling you what size or what sex of whitetail made the, the droppings. For example, if the droppings are very fresh, it probably means that those, that deer is using this trail or this feeding area today. Uh, if you're heading out toward a feeding area in the morning or run across real fresh tracks or droppings on the trail that you're using to get there, really fresh ones, uh, it's good to know if they're really fresh or not because that deer is probably out there right now in the morning. Or if you're heading back to camp and they're really fresh, it might tell you, this is, I better go back there today in the afternoon and hunt there till dark. Or if you're heading in to camp in the evening and you find really fresh ones, it's telling you, this is a place I probably should hunt tomorrow morning, get there well be first, before first light in the morning. Especially if they're those big droppings, three quarters to an inch long. Now, they're fresh when they're shiny. That means they're still damp. Now, they dry out fairly fast in one in 24 hours. They can go from being shiny to dull in appearance. If they're not shiny, they're not fresh. They're pro those droppings are more than 24 hours old. You can have shiny droppings that have frost on them, little bits of white frost all over them. Now, it depends on how cold it is. If there are frost on them and it's, the temperature is in the 20s, probably uh, those were made during the previous uh, feeding time in that area, in the feeding area. If there, if there's no no frost on them, that buck or that deer was in that feeding area hours ago or is in part of the feeding area right now. So fresh is important. Old droppings are old news. If all you find is older droppings that are dull in appearance, uh, then they aren't as important as droppings that are really fresh or that are really shiny. So shiny droppings are, are the one you want to find. But all droppings can add a measure of, of uh, importance. Like for example, if you're scouting and you find a deer trail with, with big buck tracks in it and lots of droppings made by the buck as well, you might walk along that trail and every 25, 50 yards, you find more big droppings, three quarters to an inch long. Now, if there's really fresh droppings on that trail and older droppings, dull droppings, probably clumped, uh, it tells you this deer has been using this trail quite a while. That's a good buck trail to have in mind when you're trying to figure out where your stand site should be. Now, if there are only fresh droppings on that trail, it might mean he only used it today. Now, during hunting seasons, big bucks have a habit of never using the same trail twice in a row. Once they realize there's a human in the area, and that's easy to do. Here's some fresh trail scent here on the trail. Uh, that buck is not going to probably use that trail again uh, that same day, and maybe not until a week later, if at all, during the hunting season. So, but at any rate, uh, if you find fresh buck droppings on a trail, it may not be important if it's a long way from a feeding area or a watering spot or a bedding area. It might just be one of those in-between trails. Uh, every whitetail, like say, he gets up in the morning around 4 or so a.m., one of the first things a big buck will do in his bedding area when he arises in the morning, this is true of all deer, 
is emptying his bowl. And that's why uh, bedding areas have lots of droppings in them. In a buck bedding area, they'll all be the same size big droppings. If it's doe bedding area and she's in the estrus, in heat, uh, and you find very fresh droppings, uh, the big ones, the three quarters to an inch long, in that bedding area, no older ones, just the big ones, plus fresh doe droppings. That's the bedding area of a doe in heat. Uh, if there's a lot, you won't find a lot of old droppings made by the big buck in a doe bedding area. They come through there once in a while uh, before breeding begins, during the two to three weeks before breeding begins, because they're checking on does almost every day in their home ranges until that time. But anyway, uh, that's something you should know. Uh, if you find tracks of two deer, you know, three inch tracks on your gee, it could be a doe, and there's no little tracks there of a fawn, and, but there's some big tracks of a, of a dominant breeding buck, say four inches along that. And, and you're not sure whether those are fresh or not. Uh, they, the impressions made by the tracks might not be really sharp like they would be in damp soil or in snow. But you find really fresh droppings of a big buck along that trail, you know, shiny ones and real fresh tracks or droppings of a doe, or one or the other, if they're fresh, then that's pretty, they, are very, that, they were made just a short time ago. And if they were heading to a feeding area or from a feeding area, uh, either the deer are, right, are there right now, if they were heading in that direction, or to, uh, during the next period whitetails feed, they'll be heading back there. To, so sometimes fresh doe droppings along a trail like that where you have bigger tracks and smaller tracks, maybe just one or two even. Uh, here's a big one right here. And oh, here's a small one over here. That's all you need to know that that's going to be a dynamite spot, that feeding area to hunt during the next hour's whitetails feed. One of the first things that the whitetails do in the morning when they arrive from their bed is empty their balls. And this is why bedding areas have a lot of deer, deer droppings in them, usually fresh and old. Uh, the next thing they're going to do, uh, I know the whitetails in the area, we have a lot of water, a lot of beaver ponds. Uh, we have a lot of springs throughout the area we hunt. So there's a lot of different places that whitetails can find water. And that's why we don't normally spend a lot of time at water sites, but we do now and then. I've taken one big buck recently near a, a spring-fed pool. Uh, my son Ken has taken the biggest buck of his life near a place where whitetails have been watering on, on a small river bank. Uh, so that sometimes works out. But, uh, but anyway, they like to get a drink of water before they go to feed. Then they head to a feeding area. In some cases, the feeding area might be pretty close. Within every doe home range, there is one to four feeding areas, separate ones. And they, to the average hunter, none of them will look like a feeding area unless it's a clear cut or a farm field. But there are a lot of other feeding areas that are natural wild areas where whitetails feed. But on their way to them, they've got a dozen or more ways to get there, uh, depending on cover available at that time of the year, because they, they like to be hidden as they go there, like you should be thinking whenever you go to a stamp site. And, or uh, the trails they use might depend on uh, the fact that they know where a hunter is now located at a stand site. They want to avoid them, so they'll take different trails. So, but changes in wind direction and the cover available are two important things to whitetail. And to big bucks, big bucks uh, don't like to use the same trail twice in a row once they realize there's hunter's noise. The hunting season is going on again, so it's going to take different ways to get there. So, 
So your odds along specific trails uh, while breeding is a process or any other time for that matter. Except while well, big bucks are making and renewing ground scrapes. Uh, they have, your odds along any specific trail are not going to be really great for taking a big buck. Unless there's a lot of tracks and droppings in that trail. And there, like I've said before, there aren't many trails like that. Most trails used by big bucks are trails that were established by does with young over a number of years and in repeated boring through cover. They create kind of tunnel-like openings in cover going from place to place. So there's, when you're in a doe range, and I've said that before, there's lots of deer trails. You hardly can take 10 to 20 steps in any direction without coming on another deer trail. Now, certain of those deer trails will be used by bucks as scrape trails during the hunting season. And most crown scrapes and antler rubs, except those made in antler rubs made in, uh, in buck bedding areas, uh, are going to be found within doe ranges. So when you got a fair number of ground scrapes and all kinds of trails, you're in a doe range. They make those markings in doe ranges because they want other bucks to stay away from this doe on her range. And these are markers that tell other bucks, this is my breeding range and you guys keep out or you're in big trouble. And they usually do keep out, except for yearling bucks. But anyway, there's all kinds of ways for them to go. But as they get closer to their feeding area, those trails all converge to downwind edges of the feeding areas. All the trails in the woods all lead to feeding areas. And the ones that have fresh tracks and or droppings on them are the trails they're using right now to get to feeding areas. Well, when they get close to them, the trails that are right there, uh, near edges of feeding areas, get to be filled with more tracks, fresh tracks, and more fresh droppings than almost any other trail in the woods. And these are the trails you want to spend your time on, the ones that are adjacent to feeding areas. And that's why feeding areas are the very best, best places to take big bucks, except when they're uh, renewing and or making ground scrape. Now, back to droppings. <laughs> Now you know why droppings are there, uh, are, are especially common in feeding areas and bedding areas. Now, so, uh, like I mentioned before, sometimes, I, I can remember one year, I was out scouting, <clears throat> and I came upon some clump droppings about oh, uh, near the edge of a feeding area, getting close to a feeding area big clump and they were I was so impressed by those I put some in a plastic bag to show my sons back in camp boy look at these that's a buck I'm going to hunt this year and uh, that was all I had and I picked out a spot to hunt and near that site uh, I, uh, I uh, uh, stand site that didn't amount to much it was mostly a clump of evergreens that would give me, uh, I could be hidden there very well. And then I had to figure out other deer trails to use to get there for them out walking on that trail where I found those droppings of the big buck. From that time on, that trail was a place I wouldn't want to get close to, no closer than 20 yards for sure, because uh, I didn't want to put any trail scent on there. I didn't want to be going back and forth to a stand site uh, laying down fresh trail sand on that trail because that would be all a big older buck needs to know that uh, to tell him that don't go near this trail anymore stay away from this trail so it has to be different trails to get there and I had to be able to get there from downwind or crosswind so it all became important but on the basis of finding that one clump of really big drop buck droppings, oh, there have been many times, I shouldn't say many, but lots of times during the last 29 years that I have succeeded in taking a big buck. So 
tropics to me are the second most important deer sign when you're a buck hunter. Uh, tracks are number one, droppings are number two. There's more. We'll talk about more deer signs in future uh, presentations. So with that, well, let me remind you too, uh, that book I wrote or published back in 1991. This is my fourth edition of Whitetail Hunter's Almanac. It covers every deer sign, uh, more than a hundred of them, <laughs> and what they mean, and why you should or should not hunt near them. And so, uh, if you don't have this book in your library, you should get it. There's no book like it anywhere in the world, and it'll make a big difference in what you, uh, in your hunting success. So, if you want every little nuance of what you should know about uh, droppings, it's in there. Also, you'll find uh, a lot of information in my new 10th edition, and uh, also uh, some equations for you hunters in southern U.S. states uh, that will enable you to uh, figure out what sizes the droppings are for each of those five classes of deer that I've just been talking about, uh, uh, the lengths of those dropping in the area where you hunt. And there again, uh, like with tracks, you start out with droppings made by a doe alongside droppings made by a pond. Pond droppings everywhere. Just little things, quarter inch long. You find those, and if you find adjacent droppings close to that, uh, they might be three inch long, if you hunt down Arkansas or, or Georgia, uh, three eighths inch long, those will probably be the size of droppings of mature does and yearling bucks where you hunt. And you start with those, and once you got those sizes, then these equations will help you to learn. You know, when you find those, of course, you already know size of the droppings of three classes of deer and where you hunt the classes of the mature does and yearling bucks and funds, the fun droppings where your tip off that this is a dropping of a mature doe. All you need now is dropping size for yearling does and bucks two and a half years of age or older. Everything bigger wherever you want. Everything bigger than the size for mature does, a half inch in Northern States, is a mature buck. Everything bigger is buck. And you see dropping three inch longer in Northern States. That's a buck. The mature buck might, the three eighths might be only a two and a half year old with six points and maybe eight, but only thin point, thin tines and only uh, 12, 14 inch spread. But it's a mature buck. Uh, certainly bigger than a yearling buck, a forky or a, or a, or a spike. So maybe even more in the farm area where they get a lot more nutritious food, but they won't be, you just have a little basket of handlers in that case. But anyway, uh, anything bigger than, than three, a uh, half inch in the northern states or maybe three in the center states or even smaller are, are, are mature bucks. That's a good thing to know. Now, my boys and I, We've been measuring tracks, see, since, uh, uh, tracks and droppings since the 1960s. And so we're pretty good at being able to identify them without actually having to stop and put a ruler on them to know what kind of deer made the droppings. And so today, this is a sport, uh, especially important to be able to do during the course of hunting season because each day, starting about the third or fourth day of our hunting season, when we take to our cruise trails that we've talked about, uh, looking for signs of mature bucks, uh, we're pretty good at properly uh, identifying bucks by the size of their droppings, just like tracks. So we find we go on there with that. Uh, that's just a two and a half year old buck, uh, but I'll keep that in mind. Um, and keep going, oh now here's what I really like to see. Here's three quarter. That 
probably is a three and a half year old buck. If it's seven eighths or an inch, well, that's that's a big one for sure. That's a four and a half to six and a half. And, I, and remember now, few bucks survive their seventh winter, so we don't talk about older bucks. But anyway, these are trophy class bucks, big ones. And uh, we see those kind of, we don't have to stop to measure them, and that's good. Because especially during hunting season, and here, I talked to you about this in my last presentation. You don't want to stop to measure tracks because chances are if those are really fresh droppings, that buck could very well be watching you right now. He's watching you going by. If you're following that cruise trail, he's thinking, I don't have to worry about him coming over here where I am. He's just walking along that trail. He's not stopping. Obviously, he's only interested in getting somewhere way over there. So I'm safe. Whitetails do this all the time with bears and wolves and humans. But if he's sneaking along, stopping off and looking around, he's hunting. He's liable to step off that trail and come toward me right now. This is not good to be where I am right now. I'm going to get out of here and I'm not coming back here for a long time, several days or longer. So you don't want that buck come to that decision. So you have to walk steadily at a moderate pace, non-stop, keeping your head pointing straight ahead. Now you aren't looking around as you're going on. You're not hunting. You're not telling that buck you're hunting right now. You're just going somewhere else. So it's not going to bother him. He's going to remain in, in this vicinity until you come back here to, to hunt him, that, that buck. So you just keep going. So it's important to get to the point where you can say, boy, that's a trophy buck that made those droppings. And you and you know where you are here, get back to camp, look at your map, think about it. How am I going to get there from downwind? Uh, where exactly am I going to hunt? Now, if those droppings are close to feeding area, you can bet that's the feeding area where that buck is going to be this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So, uh, then you know what you need to know. Then, uh, so, do a lot of measuring when scouting before season so you get used to being able to identify a deer by the length of their droppings. And like tracks, there's exceptions. Uh, we've taken some big bucks with, with uh, three inch droppings at, and we've taken uh, some little bucks with five eighths inch drop. We've, but that doesn't happen very often. And that is no reason to say, oh, this doesn't work. It works 95% of the time. And you treat it as if it works 100% of the time. And if you do that, you're going to start seeing a lot more matured bucks and you're going to see a lot more trophy class bucks. And that's exciting. So keep these measurements in mind. Learn how to do it while on the while on the move, on the fly, and you're in business. But there's more, of course. We got other signs you need to know about to improve your odds to taking the mature bucks. And we'll maybe talking about those soon. And uh, maybe in a little clearer voice, I'm seeing my throat doctor in just a few hours today to try to find out what's happening to my voice. So, thanks for watching guys. Thanks for buying my books. <laughs> I really appreciate that. It enables me to want to spend all the time I can teaching you what you need to know about how to be regularly successful at taking mature books like my sons and I and now my grandsons. So with that, we'll see you soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks, my son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada 
or other countries. And be sure to sign up for my email updates. Here you will also find deer and bear hunting articles, my website bookstore, and much more.